Hello everybody, this is Pastor Tom welcoming you to another study in the Word. I want to thank you today for joining me. This will be our fifth session on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And what a topic it is, certainly controversial. In our last sessions, we talked about Matthew chapter 19, that uh, many people have taken that scripture where Jesus was speaking to the Jews, to the Pharisees, about a question they ask about the Mosaic Law. We made the point that we cannot even take that scripture and apply it to Christianity today, even to the heathens, really. It was just for the Jews and their Mosaic Law. And so people who take that and make doctrines out of it concerning divorce, marriage, and, re, um, divorce, marriage and remarriage have concluded that if somebody divorces a wife or a husband then they, and they remarry, they're committing adultery and uh, uh, those type of things. And it's even got into our doctrines when it came to uh, church doctrine and it came to ministry and it came to people can't serve, that if they remarry, really, they're going to go to hell when they die. All of those type of things that, that have been uh, gleaned from that particular really excellent scripture where there's some real good truth in it, but it's not relating or it's not uh, Jesus wasn't talking to all people groups has caused such a devastating um, uh, amount of pain in people's lives. This is what happens when people take a religious traditional view of certain things without rightly dividing the word of God. You can hurt people. The scriptures can really um, be detrimental to people's lives when taken out of context and not understood and fully understood and not ran through Calvary. And so we saw that. Then we were talking in our last session about the Apostle Paul, and the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 wrote to the church, not to the world, and not to uh, uh, the Jews, but to the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 about marriage. And we were talking about how the Apostle Paul, of course, when writing these words, was coming at it from the law of love. And we got to the point to where we found out that if, as an example, a Christian was married to a non-believer, all right, and they felt like they they could they, they liked their marriage still, that uh, the Apostle Paul told them, it's fine to stay with them if you want to do that, because the un uh, mar or the um, the 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 as an example, the wife who is married to a Christian who is not a believer is sanctified by the husband. In other words, comes under somewhat of the covenant of God and their children too, um, or vice versa. It might be the the wife that's a Christian. Most of the time, that's the way it is, and the husband who who is not. But if you feel like your marriage is good and you want to stay with them, fine, stay with them. But then he also said that if the unbeliever wants to depart because he just doesn't want to be married to you anymore as a believer for whatever reason, then they can depart and that the brother or sister is not under bondage in that situation. This is very interesting because this uh, seemed to contradict what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19. But again, you can't really compare those two scriptures. One's written to the Jews, one's written to the church. And this is why people are having the struggles they are with interpreting this. But where did that come from? I mean, um, how come the Apostle Paul, who was from a Jewish background, of course, a great Jewish Bible scholar, actually, um, where, why did he point that out? Now, he's pointing it out to the Corinthians, but he's pointing it out to the entire church. And the church was made up, of course, of Gentiles and Jews. Why did he say those things? Well, the Bible says uh, uh, some things in the Old Testament that most people don't even know. Uh, go to Ma Malachi chapter 2. Let's do a quick little study about this. And this will, be a, uh, will begin to help you to see some of the things that maybe people have missed. They have misunderstood. They don't, don't understand how God thinks about certain things. And uh, it will help us to, to understand our study a little bit more. Malachi uh, chapter 3. Now let me get a, take a second to get over there because I'm going to 
find it too here. Okay. And if you look down at Malachi chapter 2, this famous scripture here that people pull out, yank out, and use, which is nothing wrong with that. This is a true statement in verse 16. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. In marriage, he says he hates divorce, and there's reasons why God hates divorce. I hate divorce, too. I see what uh, divorce does to families. It, uh, it, it causes great turmoil, strife, stress, financial problems, uh, problems with the children. I mean, you could go down a long list of what divorce does, and divorce is always um, going to cause issues, no matter who it is, no matter what the reason is for the divorce, whether the divorce was warranted or not, and in some cases it may be, it's still going to cause issues and problems because you're taking two people that have committed their lives in marriage and then you're pulling them apart. And uh, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. But when we do that, for whatever various reasons we have to, and we'll talk about that as we go, it certainly causes uh, problems. Number one, uh, of course, it's a spiritual thing. You've been with that person, you're one with them, spiritually speaking, and then all of a sudden you tear them apart. That's going to cause some spiritual issues. Um, and then soulish, uh, emotional issues, soul ties. That's going to cause some issues when you pull two people apart that were uh, interleaked by this covenant. And, of course, even physical issues. There you have, then you have the family, you have the children, you have the finances, you have the divorce courts, you have all of the nasty things that come out of sometimes in divorce. And then, of course, our government does not make it any better uh, with many, much of their uh, ideas about what should happen in those particular situations financially and stuff. People have lost so much because of divorce. I know some uh, professional athletes personally that lost everything because when the when their wives left them, and in particular cases, uh, just just uh, took off with another man or whatever it was and left them, they went through a divorce, and then because of the unwisdom of the 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 judicial system and and uh, uh, you know all that, the wife was awarded half of what they they had, which was considerable, and they lost almost everything they had uh, over a period of a couple marriages, and so a divorce can cause all kinds of issues, but. I want you to see something that maybe you haven't seen. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 7 and uh, look at something because we're, we're, we're going to talk about is it ever right to divorce? Somebody will say, well, Jesus said only for fornication. Jesus wasn't talking to us. <laughs> Again, you must understand that Jesus, that that would be a, a good principle if somebody is living in adultery or fornicating outside of the marriage covenant, that certainly would be a reason that you would consider divorce, uh, depending on the situation. Maybe, maybe not. But that is not a hard, fast law. We're not under some law. And so we, we should stop using that scripture when we talk about this, because what you're doing, again, is you're putting us, trying to put us back under the old covenant, under the Mosaic law, and we couldn't, and people couldn't keep that back there, and they're not going to be able to keep it now. So understand that, realize that. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, here's something interesting. And uh, let's look down here, verse 1, just read through for a while here. When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess, and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, the Jinnites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Persazites, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, um, seven nations greater and mightier than you, and when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them, nor shall you, you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall destroy their altars, break down their sacred pillars, cut down their wooden images, and burn their, their uh, carved um, images. 
with fire. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord your God has chosen you to people to be a people for him, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. So here we, are, we see that God was telling them when they went in to fight against and take, take on these, these heathen nations, that they were to utterly destroy them. At times he even said to destroy the children and the cattle and everything. What in the world would a loving God, uh, uh, why would he do that? Well, because God knew that if his people, whom he loved, and who had separated off for his own purposes, would mingle with those people and begin to make covenants with them and begin to marry them and bring them into their family units. So you would have to carry all the bondage <clears throat> and they would begin to backslide. And this is this happened over and over. In a, in a sense, they didn't understand what really was going on here, but let me give it to you in a way that you can understand today. When they brought those heathen practices and those heathen people and married them or did any of that into their lives, they were they carried false religions, demons, demonic power, uh, demonic occultic activities, and literally brought demons into their home and into their nation. And the, the uh, those demons, being deceitful and powerful, began to deceive people. And back in those days, uh, they didn't have it a chance against that kind of thing and didn't even really know what they were dealing with. So God had to say, no, don't do that. And when you make sure that you destroy them completely so they have any influence because wherever their influence is, is uh, it is destroying people's lives. That, but here's something more interesting than that. Go to Ezra chapter 10. So we see that. And um, to me, that, that that's pretty clear. Uh, you can see why what God is doing because here we go. We have a situation where uh, if you bring those things into your into Israel, you're going to have problems. And we saw how that worked over and over when they did it anyway. They did not obey God. Now in Ezra, and I'm trying to find Ezra. Um, here it is. I want to go and read some scriptures out of Ezra. And we will see something here that I don't think most Christians even really, and maybe they just passed over it, maybe they didn't ever study it. But it is interesting, and it is uh, relevant to what Paul was saying, really, and why uh, in the law of love there's a different take on it. Okay, because the Bible tells us very clearly in 2 Corinthians that uh, we are not to unnecessarily link or yoke ourselves to believer uh, together with unbelievers. For what ha what fellowship has light with darkness, righteousness with unrighteousness, the Christ with Biel or the devil? We are not to unnecessarily uh, yoke ourselves together with them, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians. Now, the reason for that is, again, the same reason, bringing, over, bringing those those uh, 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 people uh, into a marriage situation, as an example, that's, that's unnecessarily yoking yourself together. You do that with an unbeliever, and you are actually, after you're a Christian, you're actually bringing in somebody that's influenced by demonic things many times. Now, if you become a Christian and you're already married to an unbeliever, Paul said, look, if you want to remain married to them, that's fine, because... There is a principle that sanctifies that unbeliever to the point to where God will not allow those ungodly influences, those demonic influences, to affect you and your family if, you, if you'll stay within the marriage covenant and have a good marriage. He'll protect you. But if you go out knowingly, knowing that you're not supposed to do that and do that, then you are violating something that God says is, is uh, violating the love walk, love with him. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You don't love the Lord your God with all your uh, uh, mind and strength and not keep his word or his commandments. And one of his commandments in the New Testament is, look, don't unnecessarily yoke yourself together with unbelievers. I think you can see that. Now, in Ezra here, 
chapter 10. And I'm going to read about down through verse 3 and then a few other scriptures. Verse 1, though. Now, while Ezra was praying and while he was confessing, weeping, and bowing down to before, before the house of God, a very large assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him from Israel, from the people who wept very bitterly. And Shanakala, Shakalala, can't pronounce that, the son of Jewel, one of the sons of Elam, spoke up and said to Ezra, We have transgressed. Trans, uh, trespass. We have trespassed, excuse me, against our God and have taken pagan wives from the people of the land. Yet now there is, is hope in Israel in spite of this. Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and those who have been born to them or the children even, according to the advice of my master, and of those who tremble at the commandment of the Lord God, and let it be done according to the law. Then if you look down at verse 10 of the same passage of Scripture here, it says this in 10.10. In 10. Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have transgressed and have taken pagan wives, adding to the guilt of Israel. Now therefore make confession to the Lord God of your fathers, and do his will, separate, yourself, separate yourselves from the people of the land and from these pagan wives. Then all the assembly answered and said with a loud voice, Yes, as you have said, so we must do. But therefore are many people, it is a reason for heavy rain, and we are not able to stand outside, nor the work of one or two days, for there are many who have done this. Oh, wow. So anyway, they did this, and they separated from the pagan wives under the... Under the uh, uh, will here of God in this situation. Now I want you to think about that. So here God says you just cut them off, get rid of them, divorce them. Now it happened that the men married these pagan wives. It could be the, the, the other way around, of course, but in this particular case it was the men that married these pagan wives. Okay, and brought them in. They had children. Well, God said get rid of all of them. Why? Because they were influencing Israel and would have continued to influence Israel into the occult, into idol worship, into all those type of things. And so the Lord God said, cut it off. Well, in the New Testament or New Covenant, there is a provision made by God on this in, in, first, in uh, first, uh Corinthians chapter 7. Let's go back over there. I call it a love provision on something like this, that if you wish to stay together and you're an unbeliever, and your uh, wife is married to an unbeliever for whatever reason, uh, God will sanctify that to a certain extent and protect you from even from some of the things that, uh, praise God, a, uh, an unbel unbeliever may, may be participating in or do. Interesting, isn't it? Because the law of love is very powerful. And in God's eyes, if somebody can make the marriage work as a born-again, spirit-filled Christian, because we have authority over devils, We've got us all this this wonderful covenant that they didn't have back then. You can live still at peace. And I know many people who are Christians, who are married to an unbeliever and stay together. Some of them have better marriages than, than some Christians do, quite frankly. So that's an interesting situation. But I wanted to point that out to you. Even though God hates divorce, there were times in the old covenant where he sanctioned it. Because the divorce or the marriage was more different, was more dangerous than the divorce. The marriage was more dangerous than the divorce. So we can see that sometimes that this could be true. If it was true in the old covenant, it's probably true today. And I'm going to go into a lot of reasons why. It's very important. Now, I would say this to you. We don't want to take a, a stand on the Word of God with a situation like I'm talking about and just kind of say, okay, um, we have a way out of our marriage. And I'm under pressure in my marriage. I'm struggling. We're not getting along. We, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so now that I've heard Pastor Tom talk about this, or another preacher talk about this, oh my gosh, I see a way out. 
and just call somebody a heathen or whatever it is just because they're struggling spiritually just because maybe they're not, they're not where you you are spiritually you don't seem compatible that's not what I'm talking about at all let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 because remember everything in the new cut co- New Covenant revol- revolves around love. And you must understand that. Every decision we make needs to be a decision based on love. In a marriage, I made the comment in our last session, I'll make it again because it's important. In marriage, if both the the Christian couple, has to be a born-again couple at least, or born-again spirit-filled couple, if they will commit to the love walk and walk in love and do the Word of God, that way, they will never end up in divorce because the love of God will restrain them from making those type of decisions. It will it will it will encourage you and continually uh, press you to make changes in your life, to get along, to find ways to do it, to work together. Because love is totally unselfish, and divorce is selfish. People who divorce for whatever reason. Uh, you'll find their selfishness in it. Now, it may not totally be somebody's fault. Uh, somebody may be t- uh, totally uh, not at fault in the in the in the divorce, like that the man we read about in the first story we told out of Brother Hagen's book. He didn't even know his wife was a prostitute, run with other men, and she took off on him. Well, that it, it, really he didn't have any any sin in that. It wasn't his fault. He wanted that marriage to work. He loved her. He was going to treat her right. And, and, and certainly it, it tore him up. And when he found out about it, that wasn't his fault. He was stupid, <laughs> but it wasn't his fault. But it was her fault because she was selfish. Selfish human beings do weird stuff. And selfish Christians do weird stuff. So to just to say, okay, here's the rules in marriage. If you get divorced, you commit adultery. You can't uh, pastor in our church. You can't, you know, you can't ever hold a position of authority in the church again. All that is just ludicrous. There's no love in that because you don't know what the situation is. On the other hand, if you got some guy or some gal that's been divorced four or five times, you have to look at that as something that this person, uh, depending on the situation, of course, most of the time, three or four or five divorces. There's, there's selfishness on both people, or maybe even on the, per, on, on the person who's been divorced in some way. There's got to be, because the uh, love of God would have constrained that. And so, in a situation like that, you might con- want to consider, hey, you know what, this guy or this person maybe, maybe needs to take some time off ministry or whatever, depending on the situation. Um, and I, I think it even, even before that. But you see what I'm saying. Every situation is different. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Bible because I want you to see what love does and what, how God is. God is love. And if we start here uh, at verse 4, love endures with patience and serenity. Love is kind and thoughtful. And it is not jealous or envious. Love does not brag. It does not proud or arrogant. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily provoked, nor overly sensitive, and easily angered. It does not take into account a wrong endured. It does not rejoice at injustice, but rejoices with the truth when right and truth prevail. Love bears all things, regardless of what comes, believes all things, looking for the best in each one, hopes all things, remaining steadfast during difficult times, endures all things without weakening, love never fails, it never fades out or ends. All right, those are not a lot of words, but within the context of those words about what love is out of the Amplified Bible, and this is the new Amplified Bible, the old ones I think even better, you find out that these attributes that he talks about when developed in any human being, taken over into a context of marriage, that marriage could never fail. Love never fails. So when the prevailing force 
in any marriage is two, when two born again Christians are together, the prevailing force is love. Love is going to cause that marriage not to fail. All these other attributes will help that. I mean, think about it. Love endures with patience. You're going to have to have patience, tremendous patience to make a marriage work. Serenity. It's kind. That helps. Thoughtfulness helps. Not being jealous or envious helps. Does not brag. It's not proud or arrogant. That helps. It's not rude. That helps. It's not self-seeking. That helps. It's not provoked. Overly sensitive and easily angered. That helps. Does not take into account a wrong and endure. That, that, that helps, definitely. Uh, it doesn't rejoice in injustice. Rejoices with tri- right truth prevail. That helps. Bears all things. Believes all things, regardless of what comes. You know, hopes all things. Remains steadfast during difficult times. All these things are the things that a marriage has to have to endure. It never fails. Can you see what I'm saying? So, really, when you talk about the New Covenant or the New Testament, when you talk about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, when you talk about two Christians learning to walk in love and walking in the love walk, that is really the key. That is the answer to all marriage issues. Okay, you can go to counseling for 3,000 years, and basically, they're gonna, if they're good counselors and Christian counselors, they're going to tell you basically the same thing in a million words. You cannot live for yourself, be selfish, be self-centered, just uh, and, and have, have no love flowing in a marriage and expect it to work well. But when two Christians will will dedicate their lives to this, all right, in marriage, then you're going to have a successful marriage 100% of the time. Now, unfortunately, um, when I talk about these things, I also have to remind you that not everybody, not everybody, okay, in, in Christian life, walks in love. And over the years, I have seen situations arise that I question whether it was more important or better for somebody to go through a divorce than to remarry or to, uh, to stay married. Because even though, and I got to tell you this, sometimes it can be an unbeliever. If a Christian wife, as an example, is married to a man who is an unbeliever, and this particular guy is abusive, beats the kids, abuses the kids sexually, uh, runs off, takes all the money, you know, on and on and on the way all this goes. Of course, in a situation like that, most people who have any kind of common sense about them would say, this man is not doing his uh, Christian duty at all, and for her to divorce him would be probably the right thing to protect herself, the children, or at least to separate and see if there could be a reconciliation if he will give his life to the Lord over a period of time. But You don't know that for sure. Unless you have a word from God, unless God speaks to you about it, you do not know whether somebody's going to change their lives and you'll be sitting there 10 years from now waiting on this individual unless you really know it may be wise to do that. Now, I think almost anybody would, had common sense, would say amen to that unless they're dogmatic about Matthew chapter 19. All right, but what about two Christians who are really born-again Christians? Is it possible for a born-again, spirit-filled Christian to begin to deviate from the Word of God and act and become more like a heathen, backslidden, and participate in things they shouldn't over a period of time to the point to where a marriage 
may need to be dissolved? That's a good question. One we won't answer right now because we're out of time. <laughs> but one we should talk about. We want to give you some scenarios that we've seen in our life about when a divorce really is, it's always going to be hard, but when a divorce is better for somebody, spiritually speaking, than keeping a marriage together should be the focal point of the love law when it comes to marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And so instead of taking a certain scripture and saying this is what it means for everybody, okay, when it doesn't, let's use common sense and understand that every situation has to be looked at differently because every situation can be a little bit different. What, should, what, what would be the best in the long run for everybody? Well, I ran out of time. If this is blessing you, please share it. I know that m there's going to be many people that are even going to disagree with me on this, but, uh, you know, love me anyway, and uh, I'll love you, and you'll find out when we get to heaven I was right on this. <coughs> but I'm just joking, but not really. But if you feel like this can set somebody free, share it, because it really has set, this teaching has set a lot of people free. Um because they're still hanging on to those those ideas, and remarriage to them is just uh, uh, you know they are am I living in adultery if I remarry, uh, all that kind of stuff, and so we want to set people free. Uh, Luke chapter four, Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted, and I think a lot of people have broken hearts over marriage, former marriages and stuff, and so we want to get them healed up. Bottom line is this: if you've been through a divorce of any kind for whatever reason. I'm not your judge on that, okay? And I can tell you this, what you have to do is you have to go forward. You can't let it hold you back anymore. No matter what your situation is, let's move forward with God because that's the only thing you can do. So that's wisdom. So do me a favor and go to our website, faithalifefellowship.org. We have free seminars, seminars there. You can donate if this has been a blessing to you. If you've been taught by us and you're being taught, you need to consider at least prayerfully, uh, whether you should uh, become a partner with us. We would really appreciate it. Remember this, feed your faith, starve your doubts to death. Until next time, God bless you.